per usual. Uh, I want to take some questions on the ICP that you've just uh, turned in, completed. Maybe talk about the homework a little bit if you'd like. Uh, then I want to give you some counsel with respect to homework number five, okay? That if you don't heed, you're out of your freaking minds. Um, and then we're going to talk again about forecast ratios. So we're going to trace back through everything we discussed with respect to forecast ratios last week. And that leads us then to talking about adjustments, which is simply another layer of uh, detail on the forecast ratio if there are some adjustments that need to be made. So we'll look at how those are postured and made. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll talk briefly about the next problem set. And hopefully we'll have kept enough time to walk into the CFA and then have everybody sit down at a computer and open up fact set. How many of you have used fact set before? Good. All right. Um, so you guys know that for your uh, essays, I've asked you to use some numbers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the best thing to do for you uh, is to pull numbers out of fact set for any given company you might be interested in. If you're not terribly familiar with the construction of the income statement, balance sheet, and forecasts within fact set, then looking at a page of a million data points and not understanding how they relate to each other can be kind of overwhelming. So I want to leave enough time to walk over there, have everybody open one up, and then spend a few minutes in there. I don't think it'll take but 20-ish minutes, uh, give or take. And so, you know, I just want to make sure we can do it. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, the problem set and the homework you just dealt with. What, would you like, what can I tell you? Whoa. Risk premium. So let's look at CAPM for a minute. So we know, and we talked about this when we discussed the CAPM equation. So the CAPM equation for RE is equal to RF plus RM minus RF times beta. Somebody define each of those variables for me, please. Common stock. Risk rate, RF. Okay, so, so when I say define, give me an example of it as well. I want a different person to do it. So your your savings bet like the ten year treasury bond. Okay, two year, whatever, however you're choosing to measure that. So an investment, the return on which is unquestionable. Okay, um, why is a treasury bond going to have an unquestionable return? They never defaulted. Never defaulted. Never missed an interest payment. It's a government. It's a government, but there are some governments on you that default and they repudiate their debt. Not U.S. Not the U.S. <laughs> yes. So why is it? What well, one item all by its lonesome tells us that the U.S. will never need to default on its debt. Because they keep printing more money. We print our own freaking money. Okay. <laughs> so if there's not enough money in the account, what are we going to do? We're going to plug in the thing in the wall, we're going to turn it up, and boom, there we go. So, so zero risk. Remember that R stands for, in, this, in all of these, is some return, but it's also some cost, right? So this is, the because we're looking for the cost of equity capital, right? Well, but it's the same thing as a return. Because if, if Anya is paying it to me as a cost, I'm getting it from her as a return. It's the same thing. All right? Okay, so that's RF. What about RM? It's the market. For what? For what? Industry. Similar structure. Yep. For, for other firms, common stock issuances in that industry. Okay? So, Karen, if I'm looking at Ford and you're looking at IBM, would our two different RMs be the same? No. Two different industries, right? But, Dariana, if I'm looking at Nike and you're looking at Reebok, probably same or probably different? Same. Probably the same. Okay. It's important to remember what that means. It's the average return on, or cost of, equity shares, common equity shares, in the given industry. RM minus RF then is some premium that we expect to get for having invested in this industry over and above RF, right? So if RM is the average in the industry, 
our M minus RF is what we got for investing in the industry over and above for simply having invested in something safe. That's the risk premium. So if I know that 0 0.0655 equals RM minus RF, and RF was 0 0.0245, 0 0.0245, I now know RM, mm -hmm. right? And it turns out RM was 9%. Answered that question in four of those, right? Yes. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Promise me. I, I, believe me, I, I promise that. I've been to that equation about a thousand times now. It was the math that made sense. I just didn't understand the premium relationship. Exactly. But you believe that. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is what we get for simply having stepped up to invest. This, the difference between these two, is what we get for choosing to invest in that industry over and above for simply having invested. Once we then interact the risk premium with the beta, which is the volatility factor, the price volatility factor of the common stock for our subject firm, you could say that this is the risk premium we get for investing in that company, whereas this is the risk premium we get for investing in that industry. Make sense? Okay, please, Kim. Okay, cool. Yep. What else? Obviously, if you, on the homework, if you didn't peg the appropriate values for the different variables, and that was in that long list, I think it was kind of matching or whatever it was, then you had a really hard time getting the right numbers and the rest of it, right? Do I recall correctly that when you put in the answer for one of those that's on those in that long list, I think it was question number two, that had like 13 different things on that. If you put in the answer, it told you right then whether the answer was wrong or right. Did it do that? No. no. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> More for you than for me, as it turns out, it was unfortunate. Because I, I had intended it for you that, to do that so that if you got one of them wrong, you would know what the right answer was so that it didn't have to cascade further down for you. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Anything else on the homework or the problem set? Can, can you expand a little bit? Because we had to adjust the current assets and current liabilities and fixed assets by the growth rate to calculate the change and then the net working capital. Okay, so and you're wanting to start to talk about forecast ratios yeah. and the outcome of them. Let's, let's wait just a few okay. minutes because we're going to do, we will do that. We're going to walk through everything I discussed about that last week and I'm going to say it again. Because adjusting like sales and expenses, it makes sense to me. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll help that make more liabilities. sense too, I okay. promise. Thank you. So is there anything else before I move into forecast ratios? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you a word of warning about uh, homework number five. I'm going to give you problem set number five, the ICP, and it's going to be, not surprisingly, you're going to have to be able to do some forecasting. You might even have to use some adjustments that we'll discuss with you tonight. I'm going to implore you to not even open up practice homework number five until you are very confident on the problem set. Don't even do it. I already did it. And what did it say? Empty. There's nothing there. <laughs> and it just there wasn't anything there, right? Uh, it didn't say anything. It's empty. It gave me a heart attack. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> what am I missing? Why can't I not do this yet? Don't even try. And don't even think about opening up the homework assignment until after you have opened up the problems, uh, the practice home. Okay, I promise you that if you do, you will have a particularly poignant reaction to it. If you're ready for it, you'd be happy as a client. And if you're not, there will be weeping, wailing, and that there gnashing of teeth. 
I promise you that you can be ready. Okay, that's my word of warning. And I, I, can, I can tell because I, I can see who opens up what when. So I'm going to be able to tell which of you uh, followed my, or gave heed to my warnings versus which of you, Chris, thought they knew me better. What? Okay. I was just messing with you. I was just messing with you. Okay. So what I want to do in order to um, kind of rehash the forecast ratio from last week, I'm going to bring it up as a spreadsheet, uh, and then I'm sorry, you got to see what I saw the forecast. There were four or five people that were mm, at, older than the average age of you guys always shockingly bright blue hair. Walking around. <laughs> <laughs> people walking around with bright blue hair. Yeah. I, don't oh. I expect that if you were 17 oh. or 16 or 18. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're there. Okay. It's, uh, there's blurry. only two of them and they're just sitting down on benches. I don't know. It's no, so we're 30. Oh, there's more. Come on. <laughs> Bang on the window. Come on, somebody. Okay. So this is the live spreadsheet from the handout I gave you, or had you pick up for the end of class, I had you pick up two handouts. One was the financial statement abbreviation, and then one was a very brief articulation of a base year, and then two forecast years from explicit period, and then a continuation year. Okay? So let's kind of walk through what's going on here. First, in order to forecast all of this, which really is in order to forecast free cash flow, because that's my biggest thing here, right? I needed to know some things that aren't immediately obvious in just how we know them, and one of them is debt. Invested capital maybe is a little bit more immediately obvious, but we even kind of made an assumption with that. So I said, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to assume that <coughs> The revenue to investing capital ratio remains constant for this firm as it grows. That's an assumption. It may not be an accurate assumption. It's what I used, and I said that I used that because if I look at the 100 firms in the S&P 100, the 30 in the Dow Industrials, they have an amazingly similar reality. That if they have a, a ratio of 1.5. Uh, one year, the ratio is very little different than 1.5 in future years. And then I similarly said that this has some bearing in reality as well. Similarly, I can look at those same firms and see that their debt to investing capital ratio remains relatively constant. Oh, it might bobble up and down a little bit, but not a big difference here. So I think we need to talk about the inference as to why that may be true and what it means when it's true or, or not. Okay. Um, Diana, your company, does it make money because of the utility it has of all of the different fixed assets that are involved in the manufacturing plant, the production, the distribution, including in those fixed assets, intellectual capital, and if we can quantify it, we would even say human capital, although way, way difficult to quantify. Would you agree with that? It makes money because of its utility of those assets. And if we pull all those assets away, does your company make any money? Probably not. In fact, if you look at that 130 firms I just referenced, seven of them make firms off of equity rather than assets. So that means 123 out of 130, that's overwhelmingly representative, right? Okay. So I think that we can't, we're on good grounds to be able to say that if the firm's assets rise, the revenue probably rises. And then the inverse is, if we expect the firm's revenue is going to rise, there's probably a realistic expectation the firm's assets are rising. If by no other reason, or if, even if for no other reasons than, we're going to reinvest our profits, our retained earnings, in buying more assets so we can have more revenues. Does that make sense? That's the inference of a constant revenue to invest in capital ratio. Okay. And in that 130 firms, seven companies this would not be true of, 123 of them, okay? So I think I'm pretty good with that. Here's where we get in shaky ground, and there's a management decision in the offing on this one. First, let me back up to this in just a second. What kinds of things can cause that constancy to not be true? 
that would cause us to have a change in revenue that is different than a change in our investment capital? Something happens in the market. Product recalls. Okay, there could be some bobbles and bungles, right? Some abnormalities. Okay. What happens? Sure. Can we forecast it? No. Can't. By virtue of their of their what they actually are. What else? Market bubbles. What do you mean by that? You had the dot com boom in 2000 when everything you bought didn't matter what you bought, everything went up. So you're talking now about the price of this common shares, which may not be re directly related to this. You're right that that happened, but I'm not sure that's directly related back. Now, as it turns out, maybe we could model some of that and that abnormality we couldn't model because that was a market. The emperor was not wearing any clothes with that oil down. Kim? Perhaps, perhaps, or for some reason, uh, Jimmy Kimmel comes on late night TV. Everybody's watching him, and he's drinking OJ. And all of a sudden, uh, orange juice uh, prices spike because orange juice demand spikes. Orange juice cost of input didn't spike, but some spread between them. Okay, so maybe there's something that again is abnormal, that's a market issue. Uh, and it, it's a demand, it's a consumer preference issue. And sometimes that kind of thing happens, but more often than not, not, right? And it happens this year, probably doesn't happen with any persistency. That'll settle back down fairly quickly. What else? There's one other thing that I'm, I'm trying to think about. As we get larger as a company, do we become more efficient? Or sometimes, depending upon how large, we got how fast we got there, do we become maybe less efficient in our utility of investment capital? Law of diminishing marginal returns. So, or we just get better because we're not already at max efficiency. We get better, in which case we have increasing return. So it's possible. So this is making an assumption that this company probably is at a constant returns to scale, such that if you clicked on, on my, one of my websites, the template that shows constant returns to scale, you're going to see, I think, this problem set, where, uh, or this uh, set of spreadsheets, but I think this is like six years or eight or something like that instead of two, because I just made it smaller so it would be a little simpler for us for this discussion. Okay? So there are some conditions. This is suggesting that we are at an economy of scale that is now not changing. And I'm not sure that that's always a valid assumption. But I'm sure that unless we have a reason to believe otherwise, this is something we have to work on. This, on the other hand, is a whole different kettle of fish. If I say that this company has a constant debt to invest in capital ratio, such that our debt is rising, tell me what else I'm saying. What else is being inferred here? You're going out of business. Um, not necessarily. Um, we are rising. borrowing more money each year, but it may be to fund our growth. If we're not growing and this is happening, yeah, we're a deep kimchi. Okay? Very quickly. But this company is growing um, at some rate, 8.6%. So, you know, that our debt is rising maybe shouldn't be all that surprising to us. It's not necessary, but it's maybe a reality that's not problematic. What else? Maybe. But we don't have any good information about future rates, so we're always going to use the existing ratio, okay? Our forecast ratio for, for interest expense. So I think in this case was six, no, 16 point for six. Users, or what else? So Bao, your company, you're growing, man. You're profitable. You've got some nice Ebert running. You've got an expanding, no plat. You're getting it done. Why on earth are you borrowing more money? Uh, so I was thinking that you need to borrow debt to get capital that you invest in to make revenue, right? So they all relate to each other. So you kind of have some circularity going on here, right? Yeah. I tend to agree with that. But is it likely a management decision, senior management board of directors, that we're willing to go back to the capital markets? Because that's what's happening here. We're going back to the capital markets every year for more debt capital, aren't we? 
Okay? It's not that this is accruing because we're not paying interest, because we are paying interest. You can see over there somewhere. But we are going back to the capital markets every time, looking for more money. Because the interest is a write-off. Well, interest Trump's is a write-off. Maybe we think that 16.36 is cheap. Maybe my ROE, ROA, something like that is off the charts. So there could be some justifying reasons for that. Maybe we're borrowing money because some of our retained earnings and profits are locked up, locked up in another country. So we do some of our business in France. We've got a lot of profitability sitting there. We don't want to repatriate that money. Our growth is in the U.S. So rather than repatriate the money and pay taxes on it, we'll just leave that cash on the balance sheet there. We'll borrow money here so that we have access to that money so we can grow here and take advantage of opportunities. By the way, that's why we saw a reduction from mid-30s to whatever, or whatever, to 21% in corporate tax rates, federal corporate tax rates, as a motivation to repatriate that money. Because there's literally trillions of dollars of profits in U.S. corporations that have been earned overseas, and that money's not being reinvested domestically. And some of it would be if it could come home without a bigger cost. That's what's behind it. That's what's behind it. Okay? So I'm not sure this is always going to be the assumption to make. And one of the reasons that I didn't give you a solution set for um, Leland is because you had some latitude to make some decisions and some adjustments, some assumptions. And if you make an assumption and it's not something that's expressly identified for you, you're welcome to make an assumption, but just identify why you made the assumption. Say, I'm assuming this because of that and back up what it is. And make sure that whatever you're saying makes decent sense. If it is silly, then it's probably gonna cost you if it's a graded assignment. If it's rational, reasonable within a fairly broad parameter, then it won't cost you. In fact, it might even benefit you. Okay? Yeah, please. So in this example, you're saying that if we extended our forecast to 2018, then we can use a lower debt to in uh, less than capital ratio because we would make sure that it's in the short money or something? Possibly. Now, what you, be, what you have to do is be showing that you have some cash building up. You don't expressly <coughs> see that, but we could assume it, and we would have some decent grounds to assume it, because our networking capital is growing. So what, one of the things we know is that our net, our current liabilities aren't growing as fast as our current assets, right? So that our networking capital is growing. So that would be a reasonable assumption. You could say that. Okay, so I point those two assumptions out because they're critical with several of the other items we're going to look at. Okay, so I come up with some kind of a forecast ratio for revenue. I come up with that by saying I think the industry's got certain uh, growth in it, the company's got a leadership position or not, uh, the, we have GDP change, we've got all these, these kinds of things that we might have to think about with respect to how will our company grow. And in this case, we're using a very broad brush stroke we're assuming that the growth for one of these years in the explicit period is the growth for each of the years in the explicit period. I'm not sure that's a good assumption. In fact, I'm sure that's not a good assumption, but until you draw, drive down at a granular level, you're going to think about that. Maybe a better assumption is to look in a very granular way, and you'll see us do this a little bit later on tonight, look in a very granular way, what do we think is really going to happen in 2016? What do is really going to happen in 2017? Is there a recession coming at us that we're kind of baking the results of that in? You know, are there some new products that we're launching? Are there some old products that are coming off patent? What do we really think is going to happen? Such that you might end up with a revenue forecast for sales that is different for each year of your explicit period. Whereas right now, we're just generalizing. Does that make sense? Okay. Such that. If I now want to look at how my revenue is growing, I've got my base year, it came right off of the income statement. My first year of my explicit period, I'm simply taking the revenue from the base year times one plus the growth rate. That gives me, gives me my new revenue. And I'll do that exact same thing for the next year, and I'll do the exact same thing for the next year, but this next year happens to be the, the, my continuation year, and I'm pulling not from the forecast rate of growth in the explicit period, but my long-term GDP. Okay? 
Any questions about that? Can I ask you a question about the debt over invested capital ratio? Yes. In the Leland example, um, or somewhere in one of the spreadsheets, it said that we can use total debt over total equity, but every time we tried, we would get a different number. Yeah, in fact, Are I we think doing you, something if you wrong? did it at a, um, a template that said um, this debt to equity, which then said same as debt to invested capital. The, the reason I did that is because I was trying to get, when I, when I did that particular example, that particular lesson, I was trying to get people to think about the relationship between equity and investment capital, okay? It, was, it wasn't what we discussed the other night. In fact, there's a couple of very important differences in that template you want to pull versus right here. For example, this column was change in networking capital net of the template, and this column was net capital spending. Oh, yeah. With networking capital and fixed assets, we can get those, but it's it's different formula, right? We'll mm -hmm. talk about that in a few oh, yeah. minutes. We struggled. I know you did. <laughs> I know you did. Because I heard from somebody. <laughs> and also, um, uh, the Farmhill Financial Excel that I just downloaded from your uh -huh. template website um, has a different formula because it's adding best owner premium. So it's What's because that? of the tab that you have open. Open the tab that says without BOP or without adjustment. Oh, okay. That's you're, you're, what you're looking at, Brianna, is where we're going next. This okay. Yeah. Don't do it to yourself. I'm not going to. So just, just <laughs> looking at this, how did you determine that 2016 was your period to start 3% instead of 8? Instead of 8? Or oh, sorry, 8%. Oh. Uh, you're... Um, Oh. Your growth rate, sorry. So I have an 8.6 and I have a 3. Yeah, but how did you, like, oh, for 2017, where does it indicate that that, that period ended there? Mm. In this case, that's my continuation year. This is years 1 and 2 of my explicit period. And the next year would be continuation. You aren't seeing the story that goes behind this. Yeah, okay. And if you're trying to relate it to the story for Farm Hill, this is an abbreviation of that, okay? And that I put together expressly for the purpose of showing you this. Okay. Because if I show you six to seven years at a time, it tends to be a little overwhelming. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So if this were if this were the case, Lynn, you would have some information that would tell you that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me move on a little bit. Can I get someone to explain to me the the functionality of the forecast ratio for our various expenses. Please, Anya. Uh, the forecast ratio basically each expense in has a relationship to the revenue. So you take whatever expense you have and divide it by the sales for that specific year. Right. So we're suggesting that there's a relationship that we're observing between the expense in the base year and the revenue in the base year for each of our expense categories. Now, in this case, we show three expense categories. It could be one expense category. It could be 190 expense categories. So based upon the story you're looking at and the income statement balance sheet you're looking at, you might need to expand or contract the offerings here what you need to do is make sure that you have a category for each one of the expenses leading into EBIT. Because if you don't, you've got a problem. Okay, because you're leaving something critical off. Okay? You also have to add them into the EBIT. Yeah, so it's part of why right now I've got this EBIT point. Okay, I'll show you that in a second. So, uh, so you said there is a relationship between the expenses and the the expense and the revenue. And revenue. Okay. So the forecast ratio, the basic forecast ratio for an expense is the expense in a given year divided by the revenue in a given year equals the ratio. Okay? okay. Thank you. And so we're also then believing that this, this forecast ratio is also going to be constant, the way that we're applying them. So what is that inferring about our returns to scale? So what's that infer with respect to our returns to scale? They're constant. So as we're getting bigger, 
our profit or loss is the exact same proportion as it was in our base year. Okay? Which again, may or may not be a good assumption. It's the one we start with because I think if I can help you understand that one, understanding how we alter it is a lot easier. Okay? So in this case, and in all, all cases for uh, forecast ratio, we work off of the base year. Okay? And so in this case, it's 83.37% for COGS, 11.69 for um, SNA sales and admin expense, and 1.53 for depreciation. Okay? So, <clears throat> you'll notice I don't have one for EBIT. But maybe I don't need one. Maybe I don't even need these in a constant in terms of scale relationship. If my expense for the next year is a function of a constant ratio that is a part of my revenue change, mm -hmm. then aren't these expenses simply changing at the same rate as revenues? Mm -hmm. Sure. So why do I even need this ratio? Why don't I just move these forward at the rate of re your revenues? Well, the answer is because in our simple constant returns to scale world, that happens to be true. But once we start making some adjustments and alter our returns to scale, I want my model to still work. Okay? So I don't want to do that. And you'll see when we open up the next spreadsheet why that is. Kim? So is that basically saying, you know, every single year, assuming that your revenue is going to be growing at a different rate, therefore your forecasting ratio will be different for each year? My forecast ratio under constant returns to scale is the same for each year. The ratio is the same for each year. And notice how, even down here, I'm still picking up this ratio, okay? Right. So every year, it's the uh, revenue times the ratio to give me the, uh, that particular expense. But in a changing returns to scale, mm -hmm. I may have a different ratio effectively each year. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that in a few minutes and how we have to think about it. Because okay. there's a particular way to think about that, otherwise you kind of mess yourself up. Okay, so we have the same exact thing going on in s and expenses, same thing going on in depreciation expenses, and EBIT simply is, do a little bit of math, because the algebra we already know, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to move over to investment capital. We're going to come back to interest expenses. We've said that investment capital is going to be a function of this ratio and revenue. And it's in this form, the revenue divided by the invested capital equals, no, excuse me, the revenue divided by the ratio equals the invested capital. Because what we have is revenue divided by invested capital equals some ratio, right? That's what's been said right here. Mm -hmm. So now to turn that into invested capital, we need to, to kind of reverse it out a little bit. Revenue divided by the ratio is equal to the invested capital, and then we find it. Well, once again, we're saying constancy, so we're living in our nice, simplified, constant returns to scale world. If our company is at mass scale already, if we are a multi-billion dollar company, are we probably already operating at max returns to scale? Mm -hmm. Or so close to them that, yeah, one year might be a little different, another year might be a little bit less, but you average them out, they're going to be really tightly formed, right? Okay. So I think that's a fairly good assumption for us to make. Now, maybe a company that's doing uh, $253 million in revenue, maybe that's not a max scale, but a company's doing $253 billion, certainly would be, right? Okay. So, again, this number is simply moving forward at the same rate as revenue, isn't it? Because its function is the function of the change in the revenue. Okay? I want to be able to calculate investment capital. What's the basic calculation for investment capital? Fixed assets. Something with fixed assets, right? Plus networking capital. That's the operations approach. Okay? And I prefer the operations approach because it lets us parse out things if we were to choose to do so. Whereas the basic finance approach, total debt, total equity, does not. Okay? 
Now, we haven't gotten to the point where we parsed anything out, but we can envision how we do that. So if that's the case, if invested capital is fixed assets and networking capital, then for invested capital to be moving forward at the same rate of sales, it would make sense for fixed assets and networking capital to move forward at the same rate of sales, right? Otherwise, they're going to become incongruous with each other. And that's exactly, well, that's the first year comes off the sheets. That's exactly what's going on. In my explicit years, I have fixed assets. And similarly, you would see I have networking capital moving forward at the same rate as revenue. And our cost returns the scale. And if I went ahead and added another column, and I'm not going to do this unless I already have it here, I do not. <laughs> if, uh, if I wanted to prove it to myself, I could add another column over here that was another invested capital column, and I would just go ahead and calculate invested capital as being this plus this in that column. And I promise you the numbers in this column would be the exact same numbers as in this column. In fact, I was with one of you earlier today and we proved that out. Janet, was that you? Okay, we proved that. Okay. So I'm in pretty good shape now. I can calculate free cash flow now, can't I? Because I've got no plat, which no plat was simply my EBIT times one minus my tax rate on EBIT. Okay? So I've got my no plat plus depreciation, both of them forecast, plus change in networking capital. So I'm, the change in networking capital is going to be this year's networking capital minus this year's networking capital, right? plus net capital spending, and what's the equation for net capital spending? The, uh, fixed assets one minus fixed assets zero plus depreciation. Right, so I've got fixed assets one minus fixed assets zero plus depreciation. And to get it up here, to get the, uh, the um, net capital spending for this row, I have to harken back to the prior year, which I don't see on this, but I do see it in my financial statements. So all the information. And by the way, as you guys are setting this up, and I know that some of you are setting up your own and even starting to modify mine, which is just fine, realize that when I'm pulling something for the base year, it's not an original entry. I go and I get it from the financial statement. Okay? Do any of you not know how to pull information into one tab from another? Equal. Yeah, so we would simply type equal. In fact, in this case, we'll just, we'll just do it. So it's this cost of goods sold equal. Go over to the financial statement. Find the cost of goods sold value. I don't know what that 6140 means or how I got there. And bring it in. Okay? So it brings it in. That way, I'm, I have very little original entry in this. In fact, if you were to scrutinize this spreadsheet, you'd see that this comes from the financial statement. This comes from the financial statement. All of this comes from the financial statement. Um, I think here, this has come from this sheet. Both of these come from financial statements. This has come from this sheet. I think these came from this sheet. Everything else, everything else on here is in a model. And I've coded it such that it just pulls from other places. So that I'm not having to type in numbers. Because I know every time I type in a number, I lose some fidelity, don't I? And if the number really is $3.89, $3.89, if I lose fidelity out here at the fourth or fifth decimal place, who cares? But if it's $3.89 million, the fourth or fifth decimal place may be relevant to me. It might be in your Mercedes, okay? Or whatever CJ's looking for. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Any question about how I've now created this or the underlying assumptions that are being used to offer. Think about it. And here's part of how to think about it. Some of you came across a template that where this was change in networking capital and this was net capital spending. Would you be able to now take that template and reconstruct it in this form? That's how you know whether or not you understand it. Would you be able to take a template like this with a whole different set of financials and go ahead and plug everything in so that you can get the appropriate numbers? Sometimes it's very challenging to take somebody else's template because you don't know where all the calculations are immediately, right? 
So whenever I look at somebody else's template, and this is painstaking, I go cell by cell by cell until I understand the template intimately, and then I start to use it. And I only do it that way because I didn't always do it that way. And when I didn't do it that way, I was sometimes embarrassed or caught short or something that I don't prefer to have happen. Okay? That was your pants down? Something akin to that. <laughs> Something akin to that, yes. Okay. Shall we go on? So I want you to think about this. Let's assume for a minute. That I have revenue in the base year at a thousand. I have an expense in the base year at 650, such that I have a forecast ratio for that expense of 65%. Rick, will you use a darker marker? I don't think you mm, can Yes, see. thank you. I can find one real quick. Thank you. What's that? That part me again? Pardon me? No, right now. To the day. So revenue in the base year a thousand and expense. And in this case, it's just any expense in the base year uh, at six fifty. So that's that I've got a forecast ratio for that expense equaling 0.65 or 65%. Okay? And now, Rand is my CFO, and he's walked in and says, Rick. I think that our growth is such that we can pick up a 2% benefit on this particular type of expense. We can, we can now get a 2% lower cost, which, thank you, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Do I decrease this to 63% or do I do something else? Well, let's do both and let's see what happens, okay? So let's say I've got revenue my, in my next year, uh, year one, of $1,100. So I've increased by 10%. Okay? And I want to know the, the expense for that year. So I'm going to take my 0.65 ratio times $1,100 and should be 715. I had it almost as fast as you did in my little head. I knew you were going there. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. I'm forecasting it. But now I believe I can take, we've said, a 2% reduction. So now I'm going to take, to get to it really, I'm now going to take that 715 times 1 minus 0.02. And that's going to equal Harry? <laughs> oh, I got the wrong answer. Okay. I think it's 700.7. So that's what happens if I take the number that is forecast for my ratio and then reduce it by 2%. What if I take and do it differently? What if I simply take and reduce the forecast ratio from 65 to 63? Then I would have 1,100 times 0.63, which is different than 700.7. How did you get that point six? Oh, you just subtracted it from here. I just took it right off of here. Uh, okay. So if I do it this way, simply by taking and reducing the forecast ratio, mm -hmm. I'm going to understate the expense. And if I understate my expense, I've overstated my profit, my free cash flow, I'm in trouble. Okay. Mathematically, this is not the way to do it. Mathematically, we take the find the expense for another year when we think we have a, an adjustment. We take the expense 
that we calculate from the ratio and the revenue for that year, and then we identify that number, and then we discount that number by what we believe our adjustment is. Okay? Let me show you a little bit about how that works here. By the way, I don't think you guys have access to this spreadsheet. And I told you last week that after I went through the next iteration of it, I would give this to you. Would somebody shoot me an email very quickly reminding me to give this to you? We have it's it. on your website. This one is on the website? It looks the it's the bigger one. It's yeah, I want, it has have, more I want you to have this one. Just because it's simple. For the next ICP? It, well, I mean, no. It's not going to be as applicable because you're going to have to do some massive changes to it. The one that you already have, you may have to do some more minor changes to. Okay? <coughs> but go ahead and email me so I can send this to you. I just want you to see it in a slightly simpler form. And simpler simply means fewer years. That's all it means. Okay? Okay. So now I've made some other assumptions. I have my exact same assumptions with respect to debt and investment capital, right? Didn't change that at all. I've got my exact same revenue forecast. But in this case, I've made the assumption that I have a best owner premium for revenue. What does that mean? Best owner premium for revenue. some sort of privilege. So, Dan, is it possible that I'm not the best owner of my company, that someone else could be a better owner? Very possible. Very possible. In fact, let's be honest with each other, if it's really me we're talking about, I'll give it a look. Okay? Okay. So, let's say that it was Brandon looking at the company, and Brandon knows everything I know, and Brandon has a customer base with his existing company, that would also buy my products As, uh, because they know his brand. And if my company's part of his brand, I now have access to a customer base that maybe I didn't credibly have access to. Or maybe he has access to a market he distributes in South America in addition to North America, I do not. Is it conceivable that he's a better owner of this company? Well, what's better mean? Better means can drive greater value for the equity stakeholders, right? That's our fiduciary responsibility. So Brandon says, I think I'm a better owner. In fact, I think because of my either existing customer base, my leadership in the market, my uh, I'm renowned for a high level of quality. Nobody knows you well enough to, for you to be renowned for anything. Um, uh, or we have, uh, we have uh, access to other markets you don't have access to. He might be a better owner, and that may be reflected in some change in sales. So I'm saying here, that's going to give us an extra 2% in sales. I'm going to say in this case, it's because his customers aren't familiar with my products, and once they become his products, they will be. So would that be, would that change be persistent? Would it always be an extra 2%? Or do you think that might dissipate over time? I think so. I think that if it was opening into a whole new market, it might be persistent. I think mean, if it was innovating some different products, it might be persistent. But if the best ownership premium here is because he's got a customer base that doesn't know my products, as soon as his customer base does know my products, we've seen that expansion, and we don't continue to see that proportional expansion on an ongoing basis. So I'm having to make some assumptions, right? So in this case, I've assumed that there's some better owner out there who would be buyer of this company. And that better owner is going to not only give me or give this company the increase at 8.6, which we calculated, but an additional 2%. And if I think it's persistent, I would have that additional 2% year over year. But in this case, I didn't think it was persistent. In this case, I believe that it's going to dissipate after two years. So I had all of it in this year half of it in the next year, and by the next year, that premium has disappeared. Does that make sense? Now, what if we said, well, it was actually a 5%, 3% because of a new market, and 2% because of this overlap of customers. 
Well, in which case, we would go ahead and appropriately model that. If it's a new market, that probably would be persistent. <coughs> but if it's just an overlap in the existing market, bless you, then maybe that isn't persistent. Or maybe it's got a three-year persistency at a declining rate, or four years instead of two years. You know, this is just a set of assumptions, and you have to identify what your assumptions are. So you'll notice here that I've got a couple of footnotes that are detailing my assumptions. If you scroll down to the bottom, and you see this. And it's on the one you already got as well. Yeah, Matt? How frequent is it that somebody would put a negative best one in there? Good question. I think it's a worse one or premium. Okay? So I don't think you'd call it a best one or premium, but you might call it an adjustment. In which case, I think we might have to question whether or not it's reasonable for that entity to buy the company. But I'm not sure that that's unheard of. Maybe you buy the company, and I'm, I've been a little bit of a competitor to you. In fact, I'm the only competitor to you. You want me to have a massive negative, right? Because if I then, if my existing company starts to lose sales, you have more of a monopoly position, you can charge a monopoly profit. So you might do that. that that's, that's inherent in industries that are in roll-up. So roll-ups are where you've got a big player in the industry, buying up the littler ones, and increasing the monopoly position. So, so that's where you would likely see that. Another place you might see it is, let's say that this company that's being acquired has some technology or a production plant or something, and you don't really care that much about what it is selling and its revenues right now. You really are more interested in its technology, its, uh, its innovations. Maybe you wanted to really acquire its R&D group, or maybe you wanted to acquire some of its patents. That's what you were really after. You just had to take the whole company to get them, in which case you might neglect the company strategically so that you could then employ those other resources in your company for an even bigger payout. So that's conceivable. Although a little perverse, but conceivable. Perfect yeah. example of that is <coughs> Adams, he grew up in a town in northern Illinois. Perfect example of that is Adams Gum Factory. Adams Gum Factory? Yeah, they owned the patent to Lipitor, the heart medication. Well, there you go. Pfizer bought them for that, yeah. specifically. And they didn't make gum anymore, probably, right? No, they did, yeah. Okay. No, it wasn't a big deal. So that's, that is a good example. Is it also possible that I buy a company because I recognize that the ability to increase its value is to decrease its sales? Is that possible? Yeah. yeah Tell me about it. Under what conditions would I want to do that? Well, aside from this competitor monopoly position. You can make more charge higher prices? Well, that's back to the monopoly a little bit, Dan. What if this company's, as I think it actually is, because I'm thinking about it, I think this company's whack is greater than its ROIC. What if the company's whack is greater than ROIC? In which case, we know growth destroys value in that condition. What creates value? Shrinking. Shrinking. And maybe the current board of directors ownership just doesn't have the heart to let it shrink, to let it get more efficient. Is that possible? So Carlos has this coming. Blood, sweat, and tears, baby. I'm here to tell you right now, in your garage in Palo Alto, California, or Payson, you choose, uh, as you develop this thing, and it was all about this baby company. Every year, every year, every year, you didn't go to your kids' baseball games. You missed some anniversaries with a partner or spouse. And, but it's everything about this. Are you really going to let it shrink? No. We get wedded to things, don't we? And we sometimes, any of you that are, are wedded literally, sometimes we know that that causes us to think irrational. Okay. That, that's the way it is. Have you seen a company like that that will, that will do that? Yeah, so have you. So think about every time you hear about a company downsizing, right sizing is a term we've even given its own nomenclature, right? Right sizing, it gets smaller. And almost always, that's a function of it trying to improve its efficiency, which is going to improve its return on investment capital, such that its, invest its return can rise above its cost of capital. That's what's at the heart of that. Tesla, right? Did they, did they announce that? Yeah, it was 9% in employee that, that, that raised their uh -huh. price like 40%. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, that's exactly what's going on, right? Yeah, I haven't heard that. I haven't seen that. I haven't been very connected recently. Um, and I just, I just, I, I just want them to keep making cars long enough for me to get mine. Model three. <laughs> oh no 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 no! Please, um, <laughs> brief, son. Um, so, so e either uh, I mean, what I'm after is a, is a what's it? It's a P100D, a, a SP100D, or if they bring out the new Roadster soon enough, I'm all over it. Yeah. It could be yours. Right. Well, you put it down and you get paid Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it didn't happen right now. Okay. And my wife and I have this hard, fast rule. We don't make purchases we can't justify, which really means that it makes it hard to rationalize things. Okay. Is better for the environment? Pardon? Better for the environment? Yeah, I'm not sure that's true, by the way. We'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, so you can see on the revenue side what a best order premium, which is simply another term for a possible type of adjustment. Okay. On the expense side, somehow Brandon and I have determined that as our company is growing, we can pick up a 3% benefit in our expenses for COGS and for SNA. <coughs> okay. I can believe that. We've gotten bigger. Brandon's negotiated better contracts for our inputs. Maybe some of that's a labor contract, whatever it happens to be. And we're going to go ahead and apply that exactly as I showed you over here on the left hand side. Excuse me, that's the base here. We're going to take the revenue, which was right here, you can't see it, times the ratio, so it's going on right here, times one minus the adjustment, so that we don't overstate, rather, so we don't understate our expense. Is it likely that even if some of the increase in sales wasn't persistent, that the proportional decrease in expense is persistent. That it can't like you, it like, can't be past a certain point, right? You can still you can still see an increase in revenue without seeing as much of an increase in like well, SNA expense. And and in this case, we're not it's not cumulative. It's not eighty three percent you come up with a number and then take 3% off of that and then for the next year take three, another 3% off and then another 3%. It's the same 3% each year. So if every year we took a compounded 3%, that would be some hyper economy of scale. Not necessarily unreasonable, but you must be extraordinarily careful in how you apply that. I'm not even going to show you the way to apply that in this class. If you're interested in how to apply a compounding reduction, I'm happy to send you a spreadsheet and an example of it so you can see that happening. I just don't want to, I don't want to put that in your mind before you complete an assessment. I don't want to load it with things that you're not accountable for. Okay? So I think that a reduction that happens because we got bigger, right? That reduction is probably persistent because it's operating off of the original ratio, right? It's not that, we're, it's not that the ratio is reducing and we're taking a reduction. That original ratio before our decrease in price is what's being reduced. It's just not compound. So it does have that kind of persistency. I'm doing the exact same thing here, the exact same thing here. We're simply doing our EBIT math here. And now we have to think about this one. So, and, and by the way, I've set it up like this. I'm going to show you some outcome in values here in a minute that, that hopefully will be somewhat surprising to you. Um, but you could have chosen to set this up differently. This is just my template, right? You can, you can set this differently. In fact, if you were to look at a version of this from today, or actually from a couple of weeks ago, this is the version from today or last week, uh, I actually had the base year up here and the ratios and adjustments under it, mm -hmm. just because that's the way I'd originally done it. No right or wrong. <coughs> I'm talking about the same kind of outcome. Okay, so interest expense. Can we agree that 16.36% interest expense for a corporation is usurious? Yeah. That's yeah, huge. That's credit card rates, right? Worse and for a company who's pulling in 253 million in revenues, that's not nothing. In fact, that's probably indicative, if it actually had that, 
of some financing that it took on in its early stages when it was a more risk uh, prepared company and it still was dealing with the legacy effect of that. Maybe it took on some debt that, uh, that wasn't callable for 10 years or something, right? Is it common for venture capitals and high rate lenders to offer the money out and the, that money must be out there for a certain number of years before it can be paid off? Yeah. Absolutely. Why do they do that? Because they're only in it for the short term. If they're venture capitalists? They're venture capitalists, but, but what causes that? So you didn't give them a chance. Well, maybe that's part of the contract as well, but here we've got the interest expense. I think we're, we might be paying it. What if, here it's, it's Matt and I now, and we're assessing this company. Matt, this is a $253 million company, or maybe it's only $30 million company when we're looking at it. Does it take us five minutes to assess this company, or do we probably put in some serious time? Serious time. I'm here to tell you, if you're looking for more than about $1,000 from me, I'm going to become your new best friend in probably the worst possible way. Okay? So I'm going to know everything I possibly can, because I am risk averse as an investor. So in this case, let's say that a couple of months of our valuable time went into assessing this company, digging down deeply. I want to know that we've got that money out there long enough to get a return on that time, as well as a return on the money, right? So I've got to keep that high rate out there for a while. So maybe I put a five or a ten year clock on this, can't pay it off, or can't pay more than half of it off, or something like that. Anything you can think of that doesn't violate one's civil rights can be contract. Anything that doesn't violate a civil right. You can even contract to break laws. I'm not suggesting that's a good idea, by the way, and it may have a particular outcome, but you can do it. Right. So, in this case, what I've done is I've said... Is that breaking said, the law in, in, in and of itself? Pardon? Wouldn't that be conspiracy, which is against the law anyway? Well, that might be a good point. If I contract for collusion, the law, that's collusion, that's conspiracy, that's against the law. Yeah, I can do it, but I probably won't stand up in court. Well, we'll stand up in court with my incarceration. Right. right? Yeah. Or the, or the you know, penalties and fines. And so in this case, the way that I'm about to apply this 10.36% is I'm about to reduce the interest expense ratio by 10.36% such that I end up suggesting a 6% interest expense for this company. Well, is that unrealistic? So here, Brent and I are getting the company ready for sale. Karen's buying the company, or she, she's the, the would-be buyer. Karen, is it likely that you have more money than we do? Probably so. You're buying our company from us, right? If you have more money than we do, is it likely you have more cash than we do? Very likely. Possibly. Credible. Is it likely you have a better credit relationship than we do? Almost certainly. Is it likely that you could drive down our interest expense to a much lower fee because of now we take on the benefit of your relationships? Of course it is. Okay? So the way that we've applied that is we've taken the debt from the prior year, because remember this is all built on an equation that is the forecast ratio for interest is equal to the interest in year one divided by the debt in year zero. Okay? So we have to go back a year to apply this, and then we have reduced that rate as well, such that we've effectively reduced this interest expense to 6%. So I'm going to change these numbers. I leave the 2% there. I'm going to say this was actually only 1%, and maybe this was 2% as well. So can we agree that those are not very substantial changes? No, more, right? Before we made those changes, we had a value using the free cash flow model of 102.25. Anybody without looking want to guess the dynamics of the change in value by that 1 and 2% change? Margin. Right? Pardon? 10%. 10% change in value? Anybody else? Hmm. 
Now, what happened here? Do I like this change? I don't like this change. Like, I have a problem with this change, don't I? Okay. We went the wrong way. We went from 100 and uh, whatever it was to 60. That's the wrong direction in the overall value, right? How come? And can we overcome? Let me draw you to another spreadsheet for a minute. Let me pull it up to take just a moment. This is the expanded Farm Hill group that I'm opening up. And in the expanded Farm Hill group, that was a value of 101 before some adjustments. After, it became 118. Okay? So I have to think about what's going on. And a couple of things are going on. We've got very small changes up here still, right? 2 and 3% rather than 1 and 2. But now I'm also using the investor required return as opposed to whack. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Okay. So I still have very small changes here. I'll take them to the same that we have in the other one. So my value has gone down here. So it's not a function of the number of years that I've projected, is it? What's it a function of? I'm discounting this at 12%, whereas, I'll now go to the one we were working on a minute ago, for our explicit two year, when I have introduced the, the adjustments, I'm discounting at 12%, whereas before introducing the adjustments, I was discounting at whack. Why am I now discounting at a different rate? Tell me about that. What's the relevance? I want a better return. I want a better return. If we're applying some best owner premiums, are we even bothering to look at the company from the standpoint of the existing ownership any longer? No. And we're not looking at it from the standpoint of the existing ownership. Why bother being constrained with the existing ownership's cost of capital? We now have to think about our cost of capital. Let me show you in this same scenario where we went from. So you're saying now we go by the investor required as we, return instead of the wow. Yeah, if we're going to introduce premiums or adjustments as a function of the new owner, there's no rational, logical reason to use the old owner's discount rate. We're into the new owner's land, right? Okay. So look, just pay attention here. Here I've got WAC at 5.52%. Here I don't have any adjustments, and I have a value using the FCF model of 102. Now, with those exact same adjustments, but a 12% discount rate, I've only got a value of 60. It's not because of my forecast. It's because of this. So if this becomes 0.0552 as it was, now look at my value. So I made a 1 and a 2% adjustment, and if I had kept the discount rate the same, it more than doubled in value with 1 and 2% marginal adjustments. We doubled in value. How did we do that? Well, okay, so let's look at our, um, let's look at our other metrics. So, I'll take us back to the, without the premium, and I had a 5.2% ROIC, right? Mm -hmm. Against a 5.52% WAC. So my ROIC was less than my WAC, I'm in trouble, right? I just maybe haven't even realized it yet. But, by introducing those revenue enhancements and cost enhancements, I now have been able to increase my ROIC to 6.8%. So it's now my ROIC is above my cost of capital. The dynamics of that should not be understated. 
we made a 1 and 2% adjustment in this company and righted the, the ship, if you will, such that we doubled its value to the investor, assuming the investor had the existing cost of capital. But we don't want to pay that. We want to pay a much lower amount because we want more profit still, right? So we go in and we make some changes and say that this is an investor required return, not whack. And we know the dynamics of that. The higher the return, the lower the value. Lynn and then Kim. So if you have a new investor coming in and they want that return rate, wouldn't that be sort of a best owner premium as well because it's because it might not be long term, it might be short term, right? I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Here's, I think, the way to look at it. If I come in with a required return of 12% in a company that has an opportunity cost of capital, really, an opportunity cost of capital of 5.5%, that's a 6.5% nominal spread, right? Whereas we would normally expect the spread between those to be relatively small, assuming all that was being brought to the table was passive cash. Because there's no reason to believe that if the company's cost of capital is five and a half percent, and all you're bringing is cash, that you're going to get much more than five and a half percent, right? So if we're suggesting that we have a twelve percent requirement, then one of two things is true: we're either bringing some other benefit to the table, which might be seen as a best owner premium, then, yeah. or we have an unrealistic expectation for return, right? Yeah. One of those two is true. I can't I can't even theorize in my little head. Something else that would be true, could, that would would have to be true for those that to exist. I think I think that's kind of the way it's got to be. So in each case, all I've done is I've kept my assumptions for my invested capital and for my debt. I've set up my forecast ratios for this. Enhancement exactly like I had before, and then I've taken some premium on sales. I have to think about whether it's persistent or not, and where it's come from. On when, on the expenses, it probably is persistent, but it can be a different adjustment for each one. It may be that I get some cost of goods sold adjustment, but no sales and administrative expense adjustment, or vice versa. One could be higher than the other, or vice versa, or they're the same. It just depends on your scenario, right? And I can then think about that as I then forecast my expenses, so it forecasts my EBIT, so it forecasts my no plat. I've got the invested capital growing at the same rate of sales, which by the way, if the, for, if the invested capital is growing at the same rate of sales, I can see that with my ratio. But if the inputs to invested capital are growing at the same rate of sales, I've got to see that by looking somehow at my, at my numbers. Okay, what's going on? So oh, on the Leyland assignment, yeah, it said that expense increases Thank lagging you. those of revenues by three percent. So in that case, I would want to find a way to introduce a three percent reduction here. That's exactly what that was saying. When I built that in though in the quiz, it didn't match up, so I just did that. Because even though it said that in the quiz, and I made an assumption that you guys weren't prepared to model that yet. Yeah. You That's didn't know right. to model it, so you're right, it didn't show up there. I probably shouldn't that because I apologize. Send me an email about the switch, please, and so I can nullify that for the quiz. Yeah. Because I, I can see where that would be a little confusing. Okay. Any questions about anything else going on here? Please, Kim. Um, just for I think it is. Yeah. So what the part of it that shouldn't be all that subjective is what the investor thinks they can get from this capital asset without any of their time and talent, with just their money. Now maybe if they're putting more money in than it needs, giving it some additional liquidity so they can take advantage of other opportunity, maybe that would have to be considered. But otherwise, I have no good reason to think that I'm going to get much more for this company or from this company than it's getting for itself, right? Mm -hmm. Unless I believe my management's better, my money's better, 
my experience is better, and now we can justify some spread between the investment return and the cost of capital. But I introduced some best owner that is because of what that new owner is going to bring to the table, time, talent, etc., which may not have been expressly identified in these. What do you think, Brianna? You with it? I think it makes sense. Yeah. Cool. It actually makes sense. I'm not sure it's easy to follow. Yeah. Just another question. So assuming that's the interest expense, you got a really good rate. So you, it's it's only a, a, a time frame, though, right, of that loan that you get, because it's not ongoing, though, right? Unless you made the assumption that there is a constant debt to investment capital ratio, in which case the company's always going to have debt. Okay. So you're trying to think about it in the world as like a consumer that you pay off debt. Mm -hmm. Companies tend to get comfortable with a certain level of leverage. Maybe it's the industry they're in that requires it. Maybe it's the market that they're facing. They're trying to take advantage of opportunity. Maybe it's the current cost of debt. I don't know what it is. But they tend to get comfortable with a certain level of leverage and tend to stay within that fairly consistently. But we think as consumers, I'm in debt, pay off. Right? Okay. Um, um, um. So let me talk a little bit about next week. So when we start next week, we'll come into this room, I'm going to ask you to spread yourself out a little bit more than we normally do, okay? And we're going to do an assessment. And just as I told you the first night of class, I've not had an assessment done for this class before, uh, which means I haven't created a test for this class, okay? So I'm going to do it in the first ones. I'm going to be very interested in the outcome. And as I've shown in the syllabus, it's worth, I think, 10% of your grade. Okay. So literally, you can bomb it completely, and it's not going to make that big a difference in the grades. And I don't think any of you will bomb it completely. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think you will. I don't think you will. Think back to last week when I had you come up to the board. You had to think, you had to stretch a little bit, but you actually knew what was going on, right? You just hadn't had to do some of it before, even though it's been there for you to do. Well, you have to do a little bit of that. So when I ask you questions in class like, what's the equation for investment capital? When I ask you about what's the basic discounting formula? When I ask you the utility of, some, of something like one of these ratios that we're assuming, these are all things that become fair game as well as some of the math. Okay. Chris? Will we be allowed to use Excel for no. this test? You'll be, able to, you'll be allowed to use your financial calculators, a writing instrument, scratch paper, and the testing. No formulas? No. Wait, didn't I, we agree we're going to have one cheat sheet? Yeah. I don't know why I agreed to that. Yeah. You I, thought you said you could, I thought you said we could use Excel. I want to know. I know I didn't do that, Gunther. Well, yeah. I agreed to. You said we were hey, oh hey, oh settle down. <laughs> what I agreed to was a 3 by 5 index card okay. where you could handwrite on one side any formula relationship, anything that you could handwrite, however large or small you want to handwrite it, one side of the 3 by 5 card. One side. Uno side. Okay. I want you to relax. What's that? What's relax? <laughs> you know, stay in compliance and not worrying about things. Oh okay. Can you give us like a study guide of what we should know? Yeah, that would be very helpful. <laughs> like, you know, what the heck do you think we've been doing for the last few years? It's a long. It's a long. Yes, it's a long. 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 It's a so the fulfillment of those assignments effectively use your study guide. Here's the other thing to think about. Have I thrown at you anything unrealistic yet that affects your grades in a big way? Yes, we spent like five, six hours doing this homework. <laughs> One day and the next day What five, is six your hours. point? It's a lot of work. Uh, basically what she's saying, it's not stuff that you can memorize and have in your brain. I promise you, 
what I will ask you to give me is stuff that you can memorize and put in your brain, especially if you're preparing a small index card. I promise. Well, what goes Mariana, into that small index card? Believe me, I'm the guy that assigns the grades. I know, but what goes in it's that index yeah. card? That we have <laughs> so many sheets yeah, and so much. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just being a whiner. I know you are. <laughs> I have absolute confidence in you. So a few of you have had classes from me before. We've had a very similar conversation to this, haven't we, Brandon? And did we all survive? We did. We did. In fact, those of us that literally were crying in the earlier part of the semester in, in, with respect to the ability to survive the class, I think that the ones that had the toughest time were somewhere well into the B range. Okay? Would you please relax? See, I don't want to take all the pressure off of you because I know you won't try. And I want an honest assessment. Did okay? you write the test yet? Pardon? Did you write the yes. test I've yet? I've written part of it, yes. Part of it, yes. Um, well, I've only written part of it, so would you like me to make it longer? No. <laughs> I, think, I think it's got eight questions on it. Is there one in-class problem in particular that you would tell us to like, go over in detail and make sure you understand it? Yes, in fact, I just did. Yeah, the one that we're going to do right now. And I said, don't even think about moving on until you knew that intimately. Got it. So I started with that, right? Got it. That wasn't just because I wanted to hear my own voice yet again. Pardon? The ICP. The ICP that I'm about to deliver to you. Yeah. Okay. Let's get really good. And this one, the solution set's online. Oh. Great. I didn't do it on the last one purposely. And you learned some things because of the solution set wasn't there for you, didn't you? Hopefully. So you did. If nothing else, you learned what you weren't as confident about and what you didn't really know. Okay? All right. Just relax. Okay, so let me give that to you. Then let's go take a brief break and let's reconvene, reconvene in the CFA. Okay? Which, as it turns out, sounds like we're going to be done early. But I might change it. <laughs> so, when, so let me talk a little bit. Steady, stay with me, please. Talk, uh, let me talk a little bit more about next week. So we're going to start. So we're going to start. I would in, I would encourage you to do whatever is necessary to be there, be here on time, because we're going that this assessment will be timed. Okay. Uh, I think at most I'm going to let it go an hour and a half. At yeah. most. Max. For eight, eight questions? For eight questions. <laughs> Simple eight questions or are they like step one, two, three? Well, they're three. not true or false. false. If it's like <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's eight questions. So it's, so it's not, it's like it's not eight questions. problems. It's eight questions. What is no plat? Oh, okay. What is the, give me the articulation of the free cash flow model. Well, for example, if you say, How does the free cash flow model differ from the KVD model? I've already done three of them that you've already answered. Okay. So, so it's a theory question. Well, no, I'm going to give you numbers. I have numbers. I always give you numbers. I preach theory and give you application, right? I thought, I, I found it, you actually will learn this. Okay, so. <laughs> Maximum an hour and a half. I might have actually make it shorter depending on the actual length of this day. Longer. Just relax, there you are. Then <laughs> we're going to break. We're going to reconvene directly after 7:30 in the conference room. So not in this room. The conference room is the Burton conference room. It's upstairs. It's next to Gore Admin Office. Okay. It's where they. It's where some. Chris is like like oh I don't want to go press a lot. Um, <laughs> so we're going to reconvene in the conference room. So we're going to press the no, we'll go on this in a few minutes. I'm talking about next week. Oh. I'm talking about next week. So after the assessment, then we're going to be in, we're going to reconvene in the conference room. We're just and there's a big conference table in there. It'll sit all of us, I think, fairly comfortably. And we're just going to have a conversation. Okay. I'm going to throw up a couple of uh, spreadsheets and such on the big screen that's in there because uh, I want to show you another complexity to. Uh, to this increasing or changing returns to scale. I'm freaking out big time. Pardon? Oh, no. Okay. Okay. So, but at that point, the only thing you're going to have left is your essay, which is due approximately a week later, right? Mm -hmm. So my guess is the way that I direct the conversation may strategically be designed to help you think about some rich iterances for your essay. Okay? But if we're just going to have a conversation, I'll probably have some drinks, maybe some snacks or something, but we'll see. Okay? Fair enough? Yes. 
A few deep breaths, a few deep breaths. I will bring a defibrillator with me. Um, and let's be in the CFA at 20 minutes to 8. I think that time will be to vent with you about how frustrated you were. <laughs> Maybe. The on the assessment or for the class as a whole? On the assessment. <laughs> During the morning. Maybe, gosh, would you please get over it, not just you, all of you. So, I know I tell stories in the class. Uh, have I talked to you about how important grades are or aren't? But we had this discussion. Yes, so I have, yes I have, but I have, still. I have a professor up to you in my master's course, that, or a program that also became my advisor in my doctorate. And Marianne, she actually remind you remind me a lot of her. She was rather petite. She looked very, very young. Uh, with the, She was like 40 years old, but she looked like she was... 18, years. Unbelievable. Uh, her name is Katrina Robin. And one night I remember talking to all of us sitting down and said, would you quit worrying about grades? They're only grades. And we commented, well, they're only grades to you, but for us, they're our ability to place them the school, the research funding, blah, 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 blah. What I forgot that she was saying, when none of us realized that she was saying is, I assigned the grades, would you quit worrying about them? Okay. No one that puts in the work in this class falls outside of the B range. No, oh, some, maybe they are above the B range. Okay. No one that puts in the work in this class falls outside of the B range. Some people who don't put in the work, and it's pretty easy to tell, okay, may well suffer from that. No one puts in the work. Do I recognize that there's a lot of material here, and some of this is higher order, and I stressed you both in your mathematics, your accounting, and your finance recollections? Of course I do. I recognize that. And I'm not unrealistic when I assign grades, so would you just get over it and be in the CFA at now 21 minutes from now. Okay, 11 minutes from now. I would, but I don't intend to come back here. Okay. I have a feeling. I think you just said I'm going home. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm going to make sure we understand it. Um, do we need to design this Excel for the essay? Do you mind reading through it? Talking briefly about the discussion you had in Iowa with respect to jobs. Oh, yeah. Would you be willing to do that when we're in there? Yes. Yeah. We're in California about Iowa. Oh, in California about Iowa? Okay. Don't let's know for doing Saturday. Can we do Saturday? Uh, let's do Thursday for sure and then see. I think we will do Saturday, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've been meeting Thursday and Saturday every time, so pretty sure we will. Are you working this Saturday? Morning or you morning, right? Well it depends what you guys want to do. I can probably just change your mind. I don't care. Just not nine, please. <laughs> Earlier the better. Unless it's like later, like six, five. Oh, I've got two in the front. We did five last week. Yeah. Uh, okay. Five yeah, but two eleven. Yeah. Majority rules, I guess. I guess let's check and see what everyone says. I don't really care. As long as it's not like it may be the majority of the I'm for sure gonna have to come on Thursday, but I don't think I can make the Saturday, yeah. Well, I definitely can't make it Saturday. I won't be here.